Amen. Brother James, come on up. He's got the same name I got. His dad's got the same name. Must be a good name. Amen. So good to have you. Sorry couldn't see your wife. She's on a retreat right now, huh? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, this is our Chi Alpha Minister to yeah. Southern? Southern University. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, yeah, like I said, my name is James. His name is James. We're all Jameses uh, in, the, in the room. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm James Price. I am uh, the director of Chi Alpha uh, at Southern University in, in Baton Rouge. Uh, we are HBCU, historically black college and university. Uh, me and my wife and our daughter, our daughter was much younger, she's, she's right back there, but we came here last year, we was kind of telling you guys that we were actually in our first semester of planting the, the ministry. Um, and so God has been doing a, a lot through uh, the ministry. Um, and so we can throw up the, the next picture uh, really, really quick. Um, Oh, there's a clicker. Ah, I see it. Ah, you got to turn it on. Oh, I got it. Got it on. Here we go. Oh, go one back. Go back. Oh, there we go. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome, awesome. Um, cool. So uh, we started a, a worship service, weekly worship service, uh, this, uh, this past semester. It's called 604. We call it 604, one, hopefully because it catches people's attention. Uh, but we actually call it 604. It starts at 604 p.m. And it actually comes from the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 4. And it says, for we die and we're buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Um, and so something that we really hone in with the students is that Jesus is offering each and every single one of us an opportunity at a new life. That we do not have to continue to live in, in old ways. We do not have to continue to live in old sin and old shame and old habits. But Jesus uh, is more than powerful enough to transform your life. Um, and so this is one of our worship services uh, that took place. And so we've been having just some people come through and, uh, yeah, hear the word of the Lord and just really be, be transformed. Um, and so this next picture, uh, something also that's been going on, uh, is that we actually had our first water baptism service. Uh, that is our backyard. Um, and so, uh, it's, it's a water, <laughs> wa yeah. <laughs> um, and so water options are a little, a little hard to get on campus. So we're like, you know what? We have a water hose. We have water supplies. So we're just doing our backyard. And so we did our first water baptism service. That's me uh, uh, on staff with us is a guy named Tyler. Um, and then in, in there in the horse trough is a guy named KJ. A uh, really quick story. KJ is actually from New Orleans. He lives in Baton Rouge now. KJ, uh, we met KJ last year, um, and uh, to be honest, he was not living a life for the Lord. Um, a lot of times, when you, specifically when you go to Southern University, um, not everybody, but there's, there is this kind of this culture of people who claim to know Jesus, but are not actually living out their lives for him. Um, and, and KJ was, was one of those guys, and over the last year, through discipleship, through really tough and hard conversations, um, KJ actually submitted his life uh, to Jesus over the last year, and so much so that he wanted to publicly declare uh, to about 30 students who were in our backyard uh, that he wanted to follow Jesus all the days of, of his life. Um, and then uh, this next slide. Uh, so this is all of us. So there, I'm, I'm there on the right. You can see. Uh, and then Tyler's is right there. And then my wife, she's on a, a, a weekend retreat uh, at the beach. Uh, living her best life. Uh, that's my wife. That's my wife, Kelsey. We've been married for uh, four years uh, so far. Um, but the really cool thing about this picture is that you guys as a church have been supporting us for the last year. Um, you guys have been consistent in your giving and ultimately we cannot do what we do without your, without your giving. Uh, this is our full-time job, this is our full-time calling, so we don't work like side jobs on the side. We don't get up and go work one job and then go to campus. Sometimes we're on campus from eight to, to 4 p.m. Sometimes we're on campus from eight to midnight um, because we are with students, living life with them, loving them, sharing, sharing the word of God with them, but also doing something that Jesus did with his disciples and just living life. So we'll be playing NCAA, we'll play games, we'll go hang out, we'll go play basketball, but we're just living life. And the hope is that as we uh, continue to have more access to the lives of these students, uh, we'll be able to share the gospel with them and impact them for the rest of their life. And so you guys are a part of, of these stories. Uh, KJ is, is right there. There's a young lady next to him named Rain. And the really cool thing about this picture is that the six students that we baptized, one of them is actually from Chicago. Rain is from California. Uh, another lady right behind me is Kimaria. She's from Baton Rouge. Uh, next to her, to the left in the back is a uh, lady named Nevaeh. She's from Shreveport. And then in the middle right there is a, a lady named Trilogene. She's from Lake Charles. And the really beautiful thing and the unique thing that we get to do at Chi Alpha at Southern University is that we actually uh, see people come from all around the world, all around the nation, to our school. And as they give their lives to Jesus, as their disciple, they go back to their homes and they spread the gospel. Um, and so we're believing, yeah. 
And so we're believing that Rain is going to go back. When she graduates, she's going to go back to California, wherever she finds herself, and she's going to share the gospel. And so that's a very unique thing that we get to do. Obviously, world missionaries are awesome, and we love world missionaries. Uh, we are, yeah, just super, super grateful for them. But the unique thing, new, new, unique thing that we get to do is we get to have students who come uh, to our campus and, and impact them and see the gospel shared. And so we just want to say thank you as a staff, as a family. Thank you for being a part of, uh, yeah, these, these student stories. Um, their lives are changed forever because of your, because of your faithful because of your faithful giving. And so, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how many of you know that there are sometimes, I'm going to put this, the clicker down uh, for now, but uh, how many of you know that uh, sometimes in our life, when we are in a valley or we are in a tough spot, there is sometimes where we need an encouraging voice in our lives to help us out of that valley. Amen. There are times where we're, whether we are depressed, whether we are anxious, uh, whether we are dealing with whatever life is throwing at us, we need a voice that sometimes says, hey, get up. I know everything looks bad right now. I know everything looks uh, uh, dim right now, but God is faithful. God is, is faithful. Sometimes uh, when we are in a tough spot, we, we need that encouraging voice, an encouraging person in our life. How many of you in here have ever had a time where uh, maybe God has sent someone to speak encouraging words to you when you were in a, in a tough spot? Yeah, yeah. Um, some of you, maybe at one point in your life, maybe you were lost in the store when you were a young kid, and when you were lost, you heard somebody come over the intercom and say, James Price, or whatever your name might be, come to aisle five. Your parents are looking for you, and you'll be like, oh my goodness, thank you, thank you, right? You probably didn't say that, you are probably just crying the entire time, right? But there was an encouraging voice that came from a certain place to, to encourage you. And so today, we're going to be looking at the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel. He was a prophet, and Ezekiel is speaking to a community that was forced from his home. Ezekiel was that voice. Ezekiel was that voice that came to the people during that time. They, were, they, they might have been discouraged. They might have been in despair. And Ezekiel was that encouraging voice in a time where the Israelites may have been in depression. They could have been anxious. They could have been dealing with something that was very, that was very dim. Ezekiel was among the Jewish captives carried to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Ezekiel prophesied and delivered the Lord's words to the Jewish exiles in Babylon at about the same time that Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, was prophesying in Judah, and Daniel was prophesying in the Babylonian court. This book of Ezekiel consists of visionary writing where you are transported to a world of the imagination where the rules of reality are suspended for a time. Um, and so if you never read the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel includes a lot of kind of visionary writing. And so for me, well, I, 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 read, I, I tend to like to read uh, books here and there. And to be honest, when it comes to books, when it comes to movies, if things and cars are being blown up, and if there's like bullets happening, the storyline could be really terrible, but if you just have like some cars blowing up, like you got me, right? Like if there's a natural disaster, if there's like earth, wind and fire happening in this movie, if, if stuff is cracking and cars are being, like if there's just like this, this very, you know, this, this visionary writing or this visionary part to a movie, you, you got me. Once again, the storyline could be terrible. It could be like, that doesn't make sense. How did this person get here? How did she go from two years old to 13 years old in one, in one hour? That doesn't, doesn't make sense, uh, but for me, you pretty, much, you pretty much got me. And so the book of Ezekiel is kind of like that. The, the book of Ezekiel, the, the rules of reality are suspended for a time, and there's a lot of vision, a lot of uh, it really kind of imagination is happening in the book of Ezekiel. And so today, I want to talk to you uh, on the title of uh, my message, Bones and Breath. Bones and Breath. Bones and Breath. Uh, when I was uh, in college, I came home for the summer, and I was looking for a job, just like every college student is, because we're broke. Um, and so I came home and uh, ended up getting a job at this place called Adventure Quest Laser Tag. And got the job, but the way the bus route, I, had to, I would have to catch the bus to, to get to work. The way the bus route ran is I would have to get on the bus and then walk like 30 minutes down the street. Um, and walking 30 minutes down the street in South Louisiana is not an option. It's just not happening, right? Um, like, I'm going to get to work and be like, hey, I'm going to clock out because I'm not, I'm not working today. I'm going to smell. The kids aren't going to like me. You're not going to like me. I'm going to need the other one. It's just not going to work out well, right? Uh, and so, uh, graciously, my dad got me a bike. My dad got me a bike. I think we went to Walmart or Academy. I can't remember, can't remember where we went to. My dad got me a bike, and, uh, man, the bike was fresh. Like, it was new. It was, it was clean. And, and so we get the bike, get it home, 
I think it's the next day, I get the bike on the bus, a uh, bus takes me down, get off, and I start riding the bike down to uh, my, new, my new job. And as I'm riding the bike down, what I actually end up doing is I actually end up putting the keys in, in my pocket. Now, my pockets weren't that deep. My pockets weren't that deep, and so I put the keys in my pocket, and as I was riding, I was like, you know what, this may not be the best idea. And so, but then I was like, ah, it's fine. Like, the Lord will, he'll, he'll keep me and guide me. It's fine, it's okay, it's okay. And so I ride my bike, ride my bike, and as I'm riding it, I think in my mind I hear like keys drop out of my pocket because my pockets weren't weren't that deep. And so I kind of look back and I'm like, ah, no, this, it's fine, it's okay. Well, I keep riding and I'm about two blocks away from the job, like literally right around the corner. And uh, I think in my mind I hear the keys drop. And so, you know, smart me decided to uh, stop the bike, look back for the keys. Well, when I stopped the bike and looked back for the keys, the bike stopped, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> And so I ended up flying over the handlebars. I hit the pay, I hit the concrete, um, and I'm on the ground and I'm in pain. Like my side, I'm like I've never felt this pain in my life. Like it, it, it hurts so bad. And so I'm on the ground, and people on the side of the road are like coming. People stopping cars are like, "What's wrong? What's going on?" It's like I, I flew off my handlebars. I'm I'm like I'm I'm not doing well. It's, it's a bad situation. And so I'm there. And eventually somebody calls my dad, because uh, I'm, once again, I'm on the ground. I'm like, can you call somebody? I'm like, don't call 911, because the ambulance uh, trip is going to be like $700. And I'm broke. <laughs> I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get a job right now. Don't, don't call ambulance. So my dad ends up coming and picking me up, puts me in the back of his car, I go to the hospital. They check me out. And I had a list, of, I had a list of, of injuries, a bunch of different things. But one of the things that happened is that I broke a bone that was connected to my pinky. And I had actually uh, cut open a little bit my, uh, I, I believe it was my liver or my spleen. Um, and I actually bruised my lungs as well. Um, right, you would have thought I got hit by a car, right? <laughs> my stuff is like, I, I literally just hit the, hit the ground and, and all that happened. And, and for me, um, in order for me to be rehabilitated, I had to, uh, with my pinky, I had to go to rehab. I had to go to rehab and, and receive just, you know, just kind of working out uh, my, my hand. And in order for my lungs to be healed, I had to actually have a breathing tool that I took home, and I would actually have to, like, literally, like, suck in air and then breathe it out. Mind you, as I'm doing this, I'm experiencing some of the worst pain in my life because I'm, like, I'm trying to breathe in. But I'm, like, Lord, I'm going to need you to help me because this is, like, this is one of the worst pains I've ever felt in, in my life. And so... I had, I had a bone injury, had to go to rehab, had to receive some help for that, and I had to work to get my breath back. And, and the Lord, uh, in, in, in the chap Ezekiel chapter 37, is going to give Ezekiel a vision, and it's going to involve bones and breath. It's going to involve bones and breath. And part of Ezekiel chapter 37, what it includes is, it includes the future blessings of of God's people. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in the book of Ezekiel, but part of what we're talking about today is about the future blessings of God's people during that time. And so starting off Ezekiel uh, chapter 37 verses 1 to, to 14, it says this, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. You alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tenderness to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone, and I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the bread, prophesy to the man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and, bre and breathe, it's, it's breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Declares the Lord. 
I want to talk to you on the title of my message today, Bones and Breath. Bones and breath. Jesus, we thank you for this morning. And God, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. God, that you would have your way in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Ezekiel chapter 37, 1 to 3, it says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. If you're taking notes, uh, first point of this message this morning, number one is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. You see, only God knows if the, de- if the dead things in your life can come back to life. Only God knows if the circumstances in your friend's life can come back together. Only God knows if the circumstances in your family's life can come back together. Only the one with all power in his hands knows if things that are dead can resurrect. Is God going to heal our friend or our family member in the, in the way that we think he should? I'm not sure, but God knows. Is God going to bring back the things that you lost? None of us are sure, but, but God does know. When Ezekiel is, uh, when, when the scripture is being written, they, they use this word. It's, the, it's actually the Hebrew term for, for God, talking about sovereign Lord. And the Hebrew term that's actually used is the word Adonai. And the word Adonai actually means Lord or master. It means Lord or or master. Anyone here grateful to have Jesus as your Lord? Anyone grateful to have Jesus as your master, the one who lets you know what to do, the one that you can depend on, that, that you don't have to continue to try to manage and, and rule your own life, but you can give your life, your life in the hands of Jesus. And we need to remember that he is our Lord because it's, it's cool to say yes and amen at church or in the Bible study, but it's hard to remember that when your money starts acting funny. It can sometimes be hard to remember that when your children start testing you. But we need to remember that he is Lord. He is our, our master. He, he is sovereign. He knows all. He is all. He controls all of it. And so we can trust in him. We can trust in him. And so number one, God is sovereign. He is sovereign. Verse four to, to eight, it says, Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones. They say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, it was a noise. Clink, 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 a rattling sound. And the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Number two, number one, God is sovereign. Number two, God is trustworthy. God is, is trustworthy. You know, this is a very powerful, powerful story uh, that we read. But as I was reading, I was like, man, this, this is a powerful story. But at the same time, this feels like a kind of a silly story in a sense. All right. So I'm, I'm just imagining if I was Ezekiel. Imagine if I was Ezekiel and the Lord takes me to, and, in a, and once again, all this is a vision. And so if, if I'm in a vision and the Lord takes me to a valley of dry bones and I'm looking at the bones and the Lord's like speaking to me. And as he's speaking to me, he's like speaking all these miracles and things that can happen. In my mind, I'm like, like the, these bones don't have flesh on them. These bones don't have tendons on them. Like they're long gone. Like, like they didn't die a long time ago. Like they're like, like it doesn't seem like they're coming back. And so as the Lord is almost speaking to me, I'm like, Lord. I don't think you understand, like, these are bones. Like, there's no flesh, they have no voice, they have no breath, like, they're gone. Like, the bones are even starting to, to decay. And, and the truth is, is that in verse 4, what's interesting is that Ezekiel uh, says, it says, uh, dry bones hear the word of the Lord. And essentially what the Lord is telling Ezekiel to do is, hey, Ezekiel, I want you to get a sermon prepped. I want you to get a sermon prepped, but I'm going to give you all the words for the sermon. Okay, you ain't got to sit down and, you know, sermon prep. Like, I'm going to give you all, all the words that you, that, you need to, that you need to know. And what I want you to do is, in, in your sermon, I want you to tell the bones that they're going to receive breath. Tell the bones they're going to receive tendons, flesh, and skin, and then they're going to come to life. 
And what I want to say here is that ultimately Ezekiel had to trust in a trustworthy God. Amen. Ezekiel trusted in a trustworthy God. Ezekiel simply had to trust that whatever the Lord said would happen would actually happen. You see, Ezekiel could not bring his limited perspective of what God wanted to do in that moment. Ezekiel could not say, but God, don't you understand that these bones are dead? They're long gone. There's no, there is no way. I mean, it stinks down here, God. There's no way that this situation could come back to life. God, don't you understand that my son is long gone, that he's not coming back? God, don't you understand that this, our financial situation, we're not just bankrupt. We have negative money. We have, we have, we have no money at all, but we have negative money. But God, don't you understand? And God is like, don't bring your limited perspective of what I can do in your life. Don't bring your limited perspective perspective of what I want to do in your family's life, in your son's life, in your brother's life, in your uncle's life. Don't bring your limited perspective of what God wants to do because he is trustworthy. We have to have confidence that God has a much greater view over our lives. He has a much greater view. I know, I know Elon Musk is really smart. I know Steve Jobs was, was really smart, but they have nothing on God. They have no, God gave them the brain to to make these Tesla trucks that aren't that, aren't that nice. Um, apparently, Elon, is, is Elon? Yeah, it's Elon. Apparently, he was like, I want you to make the ugliest truck ever. And so they did it. And it was like, you accomplished that, brother. You, you did that. It, them things are ugly. But God has a much greater mind than any of us. And so we need to trust in him. You see, Ezekiel was also in a place that demonstrated death. And if we're not careful, God will call us to places that reek of death and we'll tell God, God, there's no way that you're calling me here. Once again, God, don't you understand that they don't, they don't want you? God, don't you understand that they, they say they don't, they don't need you. They have everything they, they say they need. But God is like, yeah, they might have everything they need, but they're still spiritually empty without me. They're, sp they're still spiritually empty without me. When I, I attended the University of Louisiana in Lafayette, Lafayette, Louisiana, that's actually where I gave over my life to Jesus, was in the, um, being a part of Chi Alpha at the age of 18 is where I began to really submit my life over to Jesus. And uh, as I began to, to try to live for the Lord, and as I became a life group leader, which just means I, I led a Bible study on campus and disciple young men, the Lord started, like, I feel like he started calling me to, to disciple young men, to spread the gospel. And, and some of the some of the campus they they love the Lord, but a lot of the campus doesn't. A lot of the students aren't trying to follow the Lord. They they don't really want anything to to do with them. Uh, there'll be times where you go up to people to talk to them about Jesus, and they'll be like, "Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm chilling. I'm here for education, and I'm headed out." And um, and to be honest, I started questioning the Lord, and I was like, "Lord, why are you, Lord? Like, like they don't they don't want you. They they clearly don't. They clearly seem like they don't they don't need you." And the Lord began to show me just through people and just through reading the word that James, even though they might say that they're good, they're not. They still need me. They still have a desire for me. They just do not. They just don't know it. They just don't know it. And what I could not do is say, God, but don't you understand what I'm seeing? And God is like, I don't care what you're seeing. Understand what I see. Understand what I, what I see. Maybe you have a family member who is not following God. And it seems like they're, they're far off. No, God has a greater perspective than any of us at any moment. Maybe you have some coworkers. You're at a job and you're like, these coworkers, I do not like them. I love them, but I don't like them at all. I'm start, starting off on Monday. I, I got to be with, with these people till, till Friday? I don't know about this. But God sees much greater in our life than, than we can. Verse 7 says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. Ezekiel said, I prophesied as I was commanded. Ezekiel said, I did what I was commanded to do. You see, even in the midst of something God is asking you to do, even if it seems foolish, the question is, will you still obey his command? Will you still obey his command? Will you start the business that God has asked you to start? Will you lead the career that is more stable and go where God is asking you to go? Will you step outside of your comfort zone and do what it is that God is asking you to do. Why? Because he is trustworthy. He is trustworthy. He has a much greater view than any of us. And so we can trust in him. We can trust in God. Ezekiel said, I prophesied as I was commanded. The question for us today is what we do as we are commanded. Will we go where we are commanded to go? Will we speak when we are commanded to speak? Will we give when we are commanded to give? But God, don't you understand that, you know, X, Y, and Z, will you do what God is asking you to do? Because he's trustworthy. 
because he's trustworthy. Verses 9 and and 10, then he said to me, prophesy to the bread, prophesy son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath into them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. If you're taking those, point number three, God gives life. God's breath gives life. God's breath gives life. His breath gives life. In verse 9, he says, come, come, bread. The, the Hebrew word that's used there is this word, um, let me go back, ruach. It's this word ruach. And, and often, it is associated with God's creative and sustaining power, as well as his presence and influence in the world and in individuals. And so, the bones have come together, the tendons have, have come together, and this is, what, this is what Ezekiel sees. And they're just there, and they have no life in them, and they're just standing there. And Ezekiel's like, all right, Lord, what's the other part? Hurry up. It's getting awkward. I don't like awkward silences. Help, help. And you're standing there. And I'm just trying to imagine what Ezekiel is thinking. I don't, I don't know what he's thinking. I'm just imagining that he's like, all right, Lord, you gave me the first part. When are you going to give me the second part? And the Lord gives him the second part. He tells them to preach, and then he tells them to pray. He tells them to prophesy. And when he prophesies, the bones are standing there, and they come to life because the breath of God had come into their soul. The breath of God had come into their hearts. You see, Ezekiel had done his part. Ezekiel had preached a sermon. He shared the word of God. He spoke to his neighbor about him. He shared his testimony with his co-worker. He stopped a random guy, a random lady on the street and, and told him about what Jesus had done in his life. But it says that when the Ruach came, that is when they gained life. That is when they began to breathe. That is when they had life. Flesh and bones standing there. Ezekiel prophesies to the bread, tells it to come. But the breath of God is the reason that these bodies were able to have life. The breath of God is the reason that we're able to have life. The breath of God is the reason that your family member will begin to have life again. The breath of God is the reason that your sons and your daughters and your uncles and your cousins and your co-workers will have life again. The truth is, is that Christianity that emphasizes human preaching over God's power is a misguided Christianity. Is preaching important? Absolutely. I'm currently preaching. I preach every Monday to our students. And so is preaching important? Absolutely. Romans chapter 10, I know, I make it over there. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 to 15, I'll just share it real quick. It says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Preaching is important. Us sharing our testimony, us sharing the word of God is obviously important. But if you can convince someone that Jesus is real, someone smarter can convince them that he's not real. If someone can convince you that Jesus is worth living for, someone else can convince you that he is not worth living for. You see, it's one thing to be told that Popeye's is better than Chick-fil-A. It's one thing to be told that Fruit Loops are better than Cinnamon Toast Crunch, however you, however you feel about that. It's another thing to walk into Popeye's. It's another thing to walk into Cane's. It's another thing to, to, buy, to go to Walmart and buy Fruit Loops off the, off the shelf. It's another thing to buy that Cinnamon Toast Crunch off the shelf and get it in your home and then get the whole milk or the oat milk, whatever you prefer, and to actually taste it and see it. It's another thing to taste and see the product for yourself. You see, you, so a lot, most of the time, we cannot be convinced that Jesus is good just because of the opinion of somebody else. We have to have an experience with him as well. He has to show up in our room. He has to show up at your seat when you're at church. He has to show up uh, maybe through a co-worker, whatever it might be, but we have to experience him. We have to experience his power. We have to experience his power. We preach every Monday. We, we speak to our students about certain things. Can I just be honest? Uh, ministry is great, but ministry is hard. Uh, ministry at Southern University is really awesome, and we get to do a lot of great things, and it's really beautiful. But the truth is, is that uh, yeah, being in ministry and doing Chi Alpha can get really tough at times. 
because some of these students are in between the ages of 18 to 24, and they're trying to decide between, am I, am I going to live it up for myself and get lit and go to this party and drink all these drinks and get drunk and do all this with all these women and all these men, whatever it might be, am I going to do that or am I going to live for Jesus? Am I going to succumb to the, the influences and the temptation of my, of my peers and of my friends? Or am I going to live for Jesus? And you see, we, we preach about stuff every Monday. We talk about stuff um, in our life groups, which is our Bible studies. We talk about sex and dating. We talk about all these different things. But the truth is, is that a lot of our students, if I'm being honest, that we preach to and we talk to about this stuff, they still do it. They know that some of the things that they've been doing are wrong. And not just like students on campus, like students in our ministry. They know that these things are wrong, but it won't be, we can preach to them and tell them as much as we want, but it won't be until they experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their lives that they're going to make a change. It won't be until, until God gets in front of them and says, hey, what are you doing? Don't you see that what you're doing is hurting my heart? They won't change until they have a Paul-like experience where Jesus comes down to them and speaks to their heart, speaks to their soul. And they are convinced, not by me, not just because I know the word of God and I, and I read on a daily basis, but they'll be convinced when the Holy Spirit speaks to their life. Amen. You see, we need the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, the Ruach, to convict us of our sin. We need the Holy Spirit to help us live this life. We cannot do it without him. And the beautiful thing is that the New Testament uh, actually lets us know that when we give our lives over to Jesus, when we, receive, when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, we actually also receive the Holy Spirit. That in that moment that we say, yes, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I ask for the forgiveness of my sin. I believe in your death, burial, resurrection. When, when we say that prayer, when we make that decision in our heart, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. He comes and dwells in us. And so number three, God's breath gives life. God's breath gives life. Verses 11, and 11 to, to 14. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle in you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. Point number four, God restores and revives. God restores and he revives. The reviving of the dry bones in this situation signified God's plan for Israel's future national restoration. The vision also, and most importantly, showed that Israel's new life depended on God's power and not the circumstances of the people. You see, putting breath by God's spirit into the bones showed that God would not only restore them physically, but also spiritually. I want to say this. God is more concerned with reviving your life, not your lifestyle. God is more concerned with reviving your life, not your lifestyle. God cares much, 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 much more about you than he does about the things that you have or the materials. Is material possessions bad? No. Okay? I have an Xbox. Okay? We have a car. Right? Materials, material things aren't bad. But I think part of it is we live in America, and in America at times, we tend to attach um, essentially that if, if you have a lot of things, then God has more favor on you than the people who don't have a lot of stuff, if we be honest. That's, that's kind of the, the view of like if you, and sometimes if you don't have a lot, or if you do have more, whatever, vice, vice versa. But the truth is, is that God wants to, wants to revive your life, not always your lifestyle. Sometimes we look at the book of Job and we see what he went through and he went through, he lost everything, <laughs> lost it all, went through a lot of terrible things. But the truth is, is that, and, and, then, and then he got a lot of it back. But the truth is, is that God put life into Job. God wants to revive your life. He wants to put his breath in you. He's not as concerned about your lifestyle as you are. He wants to put breath into your life. He wants to fill you with his presence. He wants to fill you with his life. You see, the bone that was connected to my pinky was, was fractured. My lungs were, were bruised. I had to use a breathing exercise to get lungs, to get uh, air uh, back into my lungs. But the thing is, is that I had to actually receive the help. I had to receive the rehab. I had to receive what, what, 
what was given to me in order to, to be healed. And today, I believe in a similar way that bones came back together in my story and the story of Ezekiel and breath gave us life, gave them life. God wants to begin to put life back into you. He wants to breathe his breath back into you. He wants you to experience his presence. But here's the thing. You have to receive. You have to receive. The bones in the vision were not there. And at one point, they did not, they did not just wake up and was like, hmm, I think it'd be a good day to come back alive. It's not what happened. They were dead. The bones were gone. <laughs> they had no hope. All hope was lost. There was no hope for them at all. But it wasn't until God spoke through a prophet and said, hey, I want you to prophesy. I want you to preach a sermon, and I want you to prophesy to these bones. You see, we can't come back to life on our own. Our own strength is not enough. Our own strength has never been enough. Our own strength will never, ever be enough. We need the breath of God in our hearts and in our lives to bring us back. You see, we don't deserve anything from God, but we can simply receive from him. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1 and then reading verse 4 and 5, it says, Paul says this to a community of believers. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even, check this out, even when we were dead in transgressions. It says Christ made us alive. It was his breath that came back into our life. It is by grace you have been saved. Every single one of us at a point in our life, we were dead. We were the dry bones. We had no hope. And it wasn't until maybe you had a friend that were like, hey, I want to share the gospel with you. Maybe it wasn't until your parents started teaching you the word of God and, and the breath of, of, of God came into your life. Maybe you were far off and maybe you came to a church service and, and you heard the word of God. He breathed his life back into you. You see, dry bones can't work things. They simply just receive. Dry bones can't demand that they have life. Dry bones just simply have to receive. And so the question I want to pose to you today is, will you receive the life God has for you? Not the one you think you should have, but the one that he has for you. The one that he has for you. If we're not careful... We'll live our lives trying to scratch and claw and get back whatever it is that we lost, get back the person, get back the things, get back the whatever it might be. But God is like, God is like, I have so much more for you. I have so, so, not even so much more, I have so much better for you. I have so much better for you. Don't try to claw and scratch and get back what you had. No, no, no. I, I have what you need. I have what you need, and it's in, it's in my hands. And God wants to give it to us. God wants to give it to us. And so here's what I want to ask um, us to do. I want to ask us to stand. Um, and somebody could come and play the keys. Um, that's okay. If, if you're able to stand, go ahead and, and stand with me. Um, but if you're, if you're here this morning, and he, here's what I want to do. I wanna, we're going to have a time of prayer. And I'm going to ask just some groups of people um, to, to just come forward, just, just to be prayed for. Um, and so um, I want to kind of do four different groups here, here this morning. One, if you're here, and you've never made a decision to receive Jesus into your heart and your life, uh, in a moment, not yet, I want you to come forward. I want you to come forward. Um, and you coming forward is going to be you saying, hey, this is a decision. I want you to just raise your hand. I want you to be bold. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you or anything like that. But I just want you to be bold and come to the, to the front. If you, if you personally have never made a decision to give over your life to Jesus, to say, Jesus, I want to receive you as my Lord and my Savior. If you want to make the decision this morning, in a moment, I want you to come forward. The next group, I want to also ask you to come forward. You see, Ezekiel prophesied as he was commanded in a place of death. And today, some of you need to make a decision to do what it is God is calling you to do. Maybe some of you need to leave the stable job and go do what God is asking you to do. I don't know what situation you find yourself in this morning. But maybe you need to come to the front and say, God, I want to make a declaration today that I'm going to do what you've commanded me to do. You've been speaking to me about this thing. You've been asking me to do this thing. I've been delaying it. I've not been wanting to do it. But God, today I'm making a decision to do it. Maybe today you just need to simply trust in the trustworthy God. Maybe over the last year you've gone through some things. Maybe the last two years. I don't know what it is. But your trust has, has started to fade in what God can do. And maybe today you just want to make a decision and say, God, I'm not going to lie. Like I've, I've not trusted you. 
I thought you were going to do something you didn't. And to be honest, I'm kind of kind of mad at you about it. Maybe you just need to be honest and say, God, although I'm mad, today I'm making a decision to trust you. If that's you, in a moment, I want you to come forward. And in the last uh, group, God is more concerned with reviving your life, not your lifestyle. Some of you this morning need to let go of what was and receive what God wants to give you now. He wants to give you better, not just more. He wants to give you better for, for your future. And so here's what we're going to do. If, that, if, if you fall into any of those groups uh, in this moment now, I want to actually just come forward um, and just kind of line up just across, across the front. Um, and we just want to take a moment just to pray with you. Pastor Jim will be up here. I'll be up here. We just want to take a moment to, to pray with you. And as we, as we pray, um, yeah, I'm just going to come up, ask you, hey, uh, we may, you know, which group did you fall into and how, how can we pray for you? And then after we're done praying, um, I just want you to just stay there just for an extra moment and just say, God, thank you for, you know, allowing someone to pray with me. But now I want to just talk to you. God, I want to give my life over to you. God, I want to um, make a decision to do what you commanded me to do. God, I want to make a decision just to simply trust in you again. God, I want to not be so concerned with trying to revive my lifestyle, but God, I want you to revive me. I want you to revive me, God. God cares much more about you. I'm not saying he doesn't care about the things you lost. Don't, don't mishear me. I'm not saying that God is this insensitive guy who's like, hey, get over it. He's not, that's not what I'm talking about today understand God cares more about you, about your life, than he cares about the things that you've maybe either gained or lost, whatever it might be. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to come down as we begin to pray with you guys. Father, we thank you for this time. And God, we pray, Lord, would you speak to each and every single person who's come up, and anybody who didn't come up, who may be in their seat, Lord, speak to them as well, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We just give you praise this, this morning. Yes. Thank you, Brother James. You just, when the Lord gives somebody a message, you know, that people sometimes when our guests come, they say, well, what, what you been preaching on? I say, I'm not telling you. I want to know what God wants to do today. Amen. Now tell me he didn't nail down some things today. And you know, I'm thinking about several of y'all as he was preaching. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for Brother James and his wife, Kelsey, and we just lift them up, O oh Lord, that they will be more victorious this year than last year when as it comes to souls and everything that's going on at Southern U University, that you give them the finance, the wisdom, and everything they need to carry out the job you've called them to do. So we just lift them up in Jesus' name. Amen.